Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's message. Our hope with this content is that it would help you come to know Jesus, follow Jesus, and lead others to do the same. If you're grateful for this word, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and also you can partner with what Jesus is doing here at Elevate City through giving. There's a link below for that as well. Here's today's message. I can't wait for you to hear it. Well, happy Father's Day. Can we give it up one more time for all the dads in the house this morning? Man, I, uh, I personally love that uh, not only my dad, but my stepdad and my father-in-law call this church home. And I just think that that's special and unique. Um, a little story, my dad loves what's happening in this church so much that recently he was, uh, he's a flight instructor. And so he was sitting on an airplane with a student just talking about the way that God's moving in our church, the way that people's lives are being changed, how real it is and how discipleship driven it is, how spirit filled it is. And this guy, his student was so inspired by what Jesus is doing in our church that he goes, I wanna sow into that. And so he gave my dad a thousand dollar check to sow into the work that Jesus is doing in this church. Isn't that so cool? And uh, so two notes, number one, bring your dad to church. Number two, convince strangers to give, okay? <laughs> That's my takeaway from that. Um, if you're new, my name is Joey and I'm so pumped to be with you today. Uh, we're gonna continue in a collection of talks on the book of Galatians. Let me hear you say Galatians. And uh, can we give Pastor Joe some love for the word that he brought to this house last week? I just think that he kicked this series off with a bang. I'm a little bit intimidated to preach after him because he brought the house down last week and set the stage for our summer study. And throughout the summer, we're going to be week by week journeying through the book of Galatians, trying to get everything that God has for us out of it. And uh, we're starting each sermon in this message a little bit different. We're starting by um, reading the entire passage, the entire chapter before we ever jump into the sermon. And the reason why is this, it's because this is the way that the churches of Galatia would have initially experienced it. 2000 years ago, the apostle Paul would have penned this letter and then a courier would have taken it. Before the book of Galatians was ever a book, it was a letter delivered by a courier to these churches. And when it got there, a leader from the church would take this letter and he would stand up in front of the people and he would read it out loud as these young congregations huddled around treasuring every word. And so that's what we wanna to do today. We just wanna treasure every word and then I'm gonna preach it for you. And so will you um, welcome my wife, Kayla, to the stage as she comes and reads Galatians chapter two. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation set before, and set before them, though, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I am not running or had not run in vain, but even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek, Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw what, that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to be, and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. 
And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For I rebuild, what, I rebuild what I tore down. I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteous were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Can we show some Kayla some love for reading that word today? So much better. It's uh, so funny. Last week when Leslie got up here and uh, she read Galatians chapter one, I turned to my sweet, shy, introverted wife and I said, hey girl, that's gonna be you next week. To which she just gave me the eyes right back, right? And then a couple of moments later, I turned back to her and I said, oh, by the way, you're not ready for the amount of times you get to read the word circumcised. <laughs> well, that's just the way the cookie crumbles. You did great, my love, you uh, dominated it. So uh, I, f- I figured we should start today by setting up a little bit of context, doing a little bit of background on the book of Galatians and why it talks about circumcision as many times as it does. And if you caught it, why it talks about a circumcision party, Because I don't know about you fellas, but that's the last kind of party I wanna go to. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, so let me give you a little bit of context on the book of Galatians. Galatians was written to address a, um, a false teaching and a massive misconception that had arisen in the early church. Um, there was this teaching that the law could save you, that the law could save you, that the Mosaic law had enough power to make men and women righteous or clean or justified before God. And so there were these group of Judaizers these people who were Jews and that were going to these new Gentile Christians. Gentiles are people who were not naturally born Jewish. And they were taking these new baby Christians and they were trying to make them Jewish. They're trying to Judaize them, make them talk like a Jew, act like a Jew, dress like a Jew, eat like a Jew, speak like a Jew, and get circumcised to fulfill the Mosaic law just like a Jew. This sparks massive debate in the early church. It is quite possibly the thing that triggers the first Jerusalem council, which is like the first church meeting in the history of the world, where they have debates and they go back and forth. And really it comes to a head when the two major players in the early church have a conflict, like a a fight, a debate, an argument. It's like Jerry Springer level, y'all. Like there is a drama in this fight. And it's between two pillars in the church, between Peter and Paul, Peter and Paul. Peter is leading the Jesus movement in Jerusalem. He has been tasked with taking the message of the gospel to Jewish people, people who are Israelites, who are Hebrews, who um, believed the Old Testament, who had grown up under the old covenant. And he was tasked with taking the message of Jesus, saying the Messiah has come, the the, the law has been fulfilled, uh, salvation is here. That was Peter. Paul was tasked with taking the Jesus movement to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, to the people who didn't grow up in the old covenant, who did not follow the Mosaic law. And so um, this debate starts to happen because Peter is on team circumcise them and Paul is on team stop it, that's weird, okay? And so they meet, and when they meet, it's a conflict. Look look at it, Uh, Galatians chapter two, verse 11. It says this, but when Cephas or Peter came to Antioch, Paul says, I opposed him to his face because he stood 
condemned. I want for you to think about this for a second. Peter is the one who Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. Peter is one of the original 12 disciples. He walked with Jesus, saw Jesus' way of life, saw him perform miracles. He was Jesus' right-hand man in so many ways. Uh, tradition tells us uh, Peter was likely the only married disciple and he was the oldest disciple. And so when Jesus left, the keys to the kingdom got placed in Peter's hands and he was tasked of building the church, growing the church, expanding the church. And so Peter is now coming to Antioch, which is where Paul is kind of centered and uh, the outpost for ministry amongst the Gentiles. And you would think that if one of the founding fathers came to visit your church, you'd roll out the red carpet for him. You'd throw a parade, you would have a gift, you would have, you know, a, uh, uh, like a potluck meal after church for Peter. But that's not what happens at all. Paul walks right up to Peter and verbally punches him in the face. He calls him out in public. He goes, listen, you stand condemned. He opposes him. Like, what are you doing? What are you teaching? What are you allowing? Paul goes on to say that what is happening is uh, that James, another significant leader in the church, was eating with Gentiles, not observing the dietary restrictions that are commanded in the Mosaic law. He's hanging out, literally having lunch with some Gentiles, some of these new Christians who know nothing about the Mosaic law, eating exactly what they're eating until the circumcision party. These guys who are just very passionate about cutting people's business off, they roll up and then Peter James gets up from the table and he's like, nope, I, 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 I I don't want them to see me here in fear for what they're going to think. Like, this is just, this is weird. This is strange. It even happens to Barnabas. Barnabas is like, okay, I, I guess that's what we have to do. If people want to become Christians, they've got to get circumcised. And this lie starts to permeate throughout the church. And so Paul is wanting to draw this line in the sin. He is wanting to make this grand speech, this massive rebuttal, put an argument before Peter and the Judaizers and anyone else who would demand from people anything other than what Jesus demands. What we're gonna look at today is we're gonna try to answer the question of what does Jesus demand and what happens when Jesus gets what he wants. That's what Paul wants to communicate to us today. What does Jesus really demand and what happens when Jesus gets what he wants? This is where we'll be today. Galatians chapter two, we'll pick it up in verse 15. Paul says this, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. That verse always makes me laugh. So glad that we're not Gentile sinners who were born to different dads than you. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Don't miss this part. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Here's the question today. When you and I stand before the high court of heaven and we are judged by the holy God of the universe, what will determine whether or not we are judged innocent or guilty? When the judge judges us, what will determine whether or not we are just and granted innocence and welcomed into eternal life? What credentials will we be judged on? Is it where we're from? Is it our family of origin? Is it our heritage? Is it our background? Is it what we eat or don't eat? Is it what we do or don't do? Is it whether or not our good has outweighed our bad? Is it whether or not we haven't killed anybody? Because that seems to be everyone's standard. Well, you know, I'm a good person. I haven't killed anybody. I feel like there's a higher bar than just haven't killed anyone lately, you know? But, but what is the bar? What is going to determine whether or not the great judge welcomes us to eternal life or says you are judged not innocent but guilty and sentenced to eternal death? This is the question that Paul and these Judaizers and Peter are debating over. What causes one to stand just before a holy God. And what Peter is wanting to do is he's wanting to draw a line in the sand and say that it is not through works of the law, that the law can't save you. No one will be justified through the law. Now, 
The law is a massive theme throughout the Bible. And if you really want to be a good student of the Bible and read the Bible and have it make sense to you, it is important that you understand what the law is. So the law or the Mosaic law, it shows up in the Old Testament and God has made a covenant with his people. We see it happen in Genesis chapter 12. He promises a guy named Abram that he is going to make a great nation out of his family. And then out of that, God gives the law and the prophets to a guy named Moses. And so sometimes the law is called the Mosaic law. Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, God gives him 10 commandments. Following that, he gives him 613 other Jewish commands. And the law begins to inform and shape Jewish way of life. The Jewish people love the law. They celebrate the law. They um, do everything in accordance with the law because the law for them is their distinctiveness. It's their uniqueness. It's what sets them apart from all the other nations on earth. They walk in a certain way and eat a certain type of food and march to the beat of a different drum, setting them apart from every other nation. All the other nations live like this. The people of God live like this in accordance with the law. And what the law was, was it was a covenant, a contractual agreement with Yahweh God for what would determine whether or not his people would remain in relationship with him. So it was, if you live like this, if you act like this, if you talk like this, if you walk like this, then I will love you and bless you and keep you. But if you don't, well, here's this other whole set of laws of what you can do to make sacrifices and how you can be forgiven. And that's where the whole sacrificial system comes from. And that's where priests come from. And that's where prophets come from is from this law. And so for thousands of years, you've got to see these Jewish people just trying to keep this law to stay in relationship with God, to keep God's blessing on their life. However, what we know from Jesus is that Jesus showed up on the scene and he says, I have not come to abolish the law. Don't think that I've come to erase it. What I've done is I've come to fulfill it. I've come to complete it. I've come to be the answer to the question that the law asks and it's, are you good enough? Don't miss this today. The law was intended to be a diagnostic not a cure. The law, the 10 commandments, the 613 Jewish commands, they were intended to be a diagnostic, not a cure. Let me explain what I'm saying there. When I was in the sixth grade, I was working on a house with my dad. My dad built several houses that we lived in with his bare hands because he's a man, okay? And, uh, when you build a house, the way that it works is you build the wall on the ground and then you go to stand it up all at one time. And so um, it, we were working late into the middle of the night because my dad um, knew that child labor laws didn't really apply to his kids. And so we were just working for less than minimum wage and way into the wee hours of the night, we were working, building this wall. And so um, we got to the point where we had stood it up and, you know, we had like work lights hanging up everywhere and we stood it up and kind of stepped back. And when I stepped back, I fell backwards, head first, 10 feet onto a concrete slab. I fell through the area where the stairs were going to be, but the stairs weren't there yet. And so literally 10 feet, I fell a straight story, straight back on my head. I was holding a light, the light went with me, everything went pitch black. And in that moment, my dad and my brother knew that I had fallen. And they took off on each end of the house and raced to get to me. And when they found me, I was completely unconscious. My body looked lifeless. Spoiler alert, I pulled through. My dad determined that he could beat the ambulance to the hospital. And so he threw me in the back of his pickup truck. And the next thing that I remember is uh, being in a hospital, pushed on a gurney as a big light was shined into my face. And um, I, I remember waking up, seeing doctors, big light. They cut my shirt off of me. I, I vomit everywhere, pass back out. Next thing I remember, I wake up in a hospital bed a day and a half later. And over the next several days and weeks, I uh, went into MRI machine after MRI machine after MRI machine. And they were looking to see if I had concussions and if I had swelling on my brain and whether or not there was bleeding on my brain and whether or not my skull had been cracked and whether or not the pressure of my swollen brain was going to lead to me needing surgery. It was, it was an extremely intense head injury. And so I went into MRI machine after MRI machine after MRI machine. But here's the truth about all those MRI machines 
is that all the MRI machine could do is show and indicate that there was a problem. The MRI machine was powerless to heal my brain at all. And likewise, the law it is powerless to save us. All the law can do is show us that there is a massive problem and it's that we're sinners who are in need of a savior. The law was given. The reason that there's 10 commandments aren't so that you and I might keep them. It's to prove to us that we never could. We never could be good enough for God. We could never clean ourselves up enough to be holy. We can never fulfill what it takes to be righteous in the sight of a holy God. Listen, let's not even get started on the 613 other ones because you and I can't even keep 10. Like some of us, we probably even couldn't say the 10. I can tell you this, one of them is not to covet and I saw a Tesla in the parking lot, so we all failed. <laughs> right, there, th th there are these laws that are given and what happens in religion, what happens is we begin to believe that if I keep these laws that God will love me and that when I don't keep these laws that he's just mind-blowingly disappointed with me. When the truth is, is that the law was given to show you that you never could, that you're needy, so needy of a savior and that that savior is Jesus. And Paul is saying today, to you, to me, to everybody for all of human history that the law, Jesus fulfilled it so that you and I don't have to. And so now we don't hope in a law or in our own righteousness or on our own works or on our own morality. We hope in Jesus. Do you know what Jesus demands of us? Jesus demands faith. He demands faith. That's what he says. He's, he says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentiles sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus. Faith is what justifies. This is what separates Christianity from every other religion on the planet. It is this radical, simplistic, counter every other principle in all of humanity that sets it apart and makes it unique. That Jesus demands faith, belief, trust, hope in him. You see, grace and faith, they're just ridiculous. They're so ridiculous. They're so outlandish ideas that our brains just, they struggle to accept them. Like we so often fall back into this works-based form of Christianity that thinks that somehow we could earn God's love. He's going, you can't earn my love. My love is given to you by grace through faith. You can't earn justice. You can't earn right standing. It is a gift given to you by grace through faith. This is so simple and so simplistic today. What Jesus demands of you and what causes you to know with certainty that when you breathe your last breath here and you step into heaven and you stand before the judge, what is going to judge you innocent is that you put your faith in Jesus Christ as the son of God, that you had faith to believe that he died on the cross in your place, that he went into the ground physically, bodily, was dead for three days. But then he gloriously, bodily, resurrected from the grave, conquering sin, death, hell, the devil forever. And you having faith that all of that is true and you having faith that he is now Lord of your life, that is what causes you to stand just before a God. What you believe, not just what you do, not what you do. And this is so critical that we get this today. If we don't understand the very essence of salvation, then so much in the Christian walk is going to be confusing. It is going to feel like something that we have to do and not something that we get to do. Because when grace and salvation are a gift, we respond not in obligation, but in opportunity. We are glad to give God our lives because he so freely gave his to us. Us, it's faith. What Jesus demands is faith. But legitimate faith, and this is where we can't go wrong today. Legitimate faith in Jesus is much more than a mental exercise. Legitimate faith in Jesus is much more than just cute make-believe thoughts in your heart. 
Faith is understood as a union and faith is evidenced by action and faith absolutely changes what you do. Watch how Paul explains it in verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I'm gonna read that again. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You see this faith, it is yes, this belief in your heart, but it's gotta show up in your life. This life that I now live, I live by faith. I walk by faith. I step by faith. I act by faith in Jesus. Everything that I do is now a result from what I believe. Okay, let me explain it like this for sake of an illustration. And I understand that it's an imperfect illustration. Let's say that you had a tumor in the very center of your heart. Would you have any ability in and of yourselves to heal that tumor? Is there anything that you could do to operate on yourself, to get it out, to take the cancer out of your heart so that you could be healthy and whole and alive? Absolutely not. None of us would even dare saying, you know what? I'm gonna try to play operation on myself right now. It would require faith in a doctor. Faith in a doctor who through anesthesia and for the sake of the illustration would put you under, cause you to die, if you will, put your life in his hands so that he could operate on you, remove the infection, remove the tumor, make you new, sew you back up so that you can live life. You'd have to have that faith in that doctor to say, I'm going to do it. This is what faith wouldn't be. This is what faith isn't, but that some of us make it. Some of us go, oh, I have faith in that doctor, but I'm not gonna let him put me under. I have faith in that doctor, but I'm not gonna let him get the scalpel out. I have faith in that doctor, but no, 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 I'm not putting that on that mask and having an anesthesia going in, in, in my body. It's like we like the idea of trusting in the doctor to save us, but we don't actually trust in the doctor to save us. We can't just trust in the idea of Jesus being our savior. We have to live as if we actually believe that Jesus is our savior. Is this making sense to you? that it's more than just a thought of faith, it's faith that is evidenced by action, that I put my money where my mouth is and think that Jesus has the ability to save my life, both forever and eternity, also right here now, today. So this is what I wanna do. I wanna try to show you practically what this looks like. I wanna break down this idea for you because I almost imagine Paul's hand shaking at this part of the letter, this I've been crucified. With Christ, like if he was, if he was reading it out loud, I imagine his voice like trembling and crackling. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. And so I just want to, I want to take those pieces and just try to help them come to life for you because we just talked about what Jesus demands. This is what happens when Jesus gets what He wants. When Jesus gets what he wants, you and I recognize that I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. I don't know about you, but I often have flashbacks to who I was growing up as a kid. I often have these moments that take me back to who I was before I really knew Jesus and really walked with Jesus and really been discipled and I think about, man, just the arrogance and the pride that I lived with. I think about the way that I treated some girls that I wish I could go back and just one by one apologize to them by name and look them in their eye and say, I'm sorry. I I think about things that I did at nights at parties with friends that are just horrible. I think about ways that I used my quick wit to make people feel about this small. I think about ways that I treated my parents and things that I did to manipulate them and pit them against each other. And man, I just think back on that person that I was. And, and honestly, like if I were to roll the tape, I don't know that a lot of you would want to come back next week. <laughs> I, I, I think back on that person that I was and I think about how undeserving I feel to do something like this. Like, like how can you stand up on stage, bro? Like, how could you tell anybody what it really looks like to walk with Jesus? I just think about the hypocrite that I was and 
And I mean, I want for you to try to think about it for a second. Think about who you were before you really knew Jesus. Think about your arrogance. Think about your pride. Think about the way you viewed sex. Think about the way you viewed money. Think about the things that you did to just find pleasure for yourself. Think about the way that you viewed other people. I don't know about you, but I have moments in worship songs sometimes where like, I'm, talking, I'm singing about the love or the grace of God. And like those moments just start to flash in my mind where I did things that I'm just like, gosh, I can't believe I did that. And I feel so unworthy. But then I read these words and I see that I have been crucified with Christ. That 2,000 years ago, when Jesus died on Calvary, in some way, that old Joey, he died too. That I died, that I'm no longer that person that is enslaved to sin. I am not my past. I was crucified. The old me is gone, and he ain't never coming back. I, I want for you to try to get this in your mind today, because that this is the result of what happens when Jesus gets what he wants. You are set free from sin and shame. You are set free from the lies of your past. You are set free from being that old man and, and living in those old rhythms and habits and routines that only produced death. I have been crucified with Christ. So and this is the way that it changes church for me. You can't miss this. I show up every single week to church celebrating my funeral celebrating that that old man and that old way and that old thoughts and that those old patterns that they are crucified that on the cross the innocent jesus died so that the guilty joey could die too that in a spiritual way listen to this in a spiritual way through faith i joined jesus in his death on the cross so i could be set free to pursue the life that only jesus brings all my sin erased, penalty paid, old identity, old allegiances, crucified. There weren't three people on crosses that day. There were billions. And you and I were one of them. In a very personal way, what Paul is saying is he's saying he's been crucified with Christ. Paul is recognizing that he died that way. As Joe talked about last week, uh, Paul was previously called Saul and he persecuted the church. He held coats as people murdered Christians. The Bible calls Saul, or yeah, Saul the chief of sinners, but he realizes that he's been crucified with Christ, so he gets a new name. Saul is dead. Paul is now alive, and I believe that there are some people who need new names today who need to recognize that that old person is dead. You have been set free. Jesus paid for it, and you don't have to keep making yourself pay for sins in your past that Jesus has already put to death. This is the glory of the gospel. Next line, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I want for you to try to think about the wonder of those words for a second. Christ lives in me. The God who spoke the galaxies into existence, the one who spoke and stars became stars. He spoke and mountains burst up from nothing. He spoke and the world started to spin. That God is on your insides today. He wanted to move into your heart. Like that should knock you out of your seat. That should give you a vision for your life. That should make you look at yourself in the mirror a whole lot different. That Christ lives in you. I've been trying to wrap my mind around this reality this week. Like it's really just been hitting me in waves, the depth of this, that Christ would live in me. And so I tried to think of like a couple of illustrations and I was gonna overwhelm you with like 20, but I'm just gonna give you two of this idea of Christ living in you, okay? And so here's the first one that I'll give is um, Chip and Joanna Gaines, right? How many of you love HGTV, Chip and Joanna Gaines? Okay, four of you, all right. A lot of you guys are like, I live in an apartment, sir. I don't own a house, but uh I love Chip and Joanna Gaines and I love home renovations and all of that. And they've got this little catchphrase, right? It's a, they wanna buy the worst house in the best neighborhood. And they go into this house that looks like it should be like condemned that like, you know, I wouldn't even let my mother-in-law live in. And uh, they, they go in, that was funny y'all. That was very funny. So they go into this like really ghetto house and they are, uh, they're, they're just cleaning it up, fixing it up, totally changing it from the inside out. And I'm going, 
Oh man, Chip and Joanna Gaines coming into a house completely changes that house. And likewise, when Jesus comes into your life, it completely changes you. Like he renovates you, he changes you. There's something about his presence that makes you new. Like if somebody else moved into your house, it might look the same. But when Jesus moves into your house, everything changes. This is what he did with Paul. He took the worst house in the best neighborhood, changed his life, and it changed the world. He took the chief of sinners, moved into his life, and he became a walking billboard for Christianity. That's what happens when Christ comes to live in you. Second example illustration is this, is um, there's an old movie called Air Force One starring Harrison Ford. Anybody ever seen it? It's honestly, it's an incredible movie. One of my favorites, all right? And um, in this movie, Harrison Ford, who I'm just like looking at as Han Solo the whole time, is a... Uh, He's, uh, he's the president of the United States. And um, Air Force One is the jet that the president flies on. And in this movie, there are this group of terrorists who uh, take over Air, Air Force One. And uh, throughout the movie, it is so awesome. You should watch it today, okay? And uh, Harrison Ford is the president. He like hides in the bottom of, of Air Force One and he's trying to like save the day the whole time. And um, throughout it, they like get people off the plane via parachutes. And then like at the end, he like finally kills the bad guys or whatever, but the plane is going down, okay? I promise we're going somewhere, people. Um, the plane is going down. And so there's this other big like airliner jet that's like, um, I don't know, a military type of aircraft. And um, they get this like, rip cable that connects from Air Force One to this other military jet. And one by one, they're sending passengers from Air Force One to the jet, from Air Force One to the jet, and they're all making it there. And, and then the final scene, right, the, the ship is going down, or Air Force One is going down, it's about to hit the ocean, and Harrison Ford holds onto this rip cable, and it's this real dramatic scene, is he going to make it, is he not going to make it? And eventually, he makes it on to this other ship. And when he does, um, they, uh, they, they send a message back to the Pentagon, back to the White House, and they say, the president is on board. Flight U-5279 has now officially become Air Force One. And everybody just loses their minds. They celebrate. They go wild. because All because of the, the, uh, uh, of the fact that a man moved from one place to the other, that identity of that aircraft completely changed. Because the president was on Air Force One, it wasn't Air Force One because it was Air Force One, it was Air Force One because who was in it? And I'm here to tell you today, your identity changes because who comes and steps into your life. It is fundamentally different. You are no longer a pauper, you are no longer a peasant, you are a son and a daughter of the most high God because Jesus lives in you. Jesus in you. It's the deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. It is your hope of glory. It is all the power that you need. Listen, you may run out of time and you may run out of money and you may run out of energy, but you have this inexhaustible source living on your inside. You've got the same power that raised Jesus from the dead alive in you. Christ is living in you. His past is your past. His life is is your life. His future is your future. His righteousness is your righteousness. His inheritance is your inheritance. His power is your power. His resources are your resources. Jesus in you is everything you need for every moment you live. The real work, listen, the real work, this is so, so fundamental today. The real work of the Christian life is to exercise the muscle of faith. It's to believe this, when you feel weak, it's to believe that Jesus in you is more than enough strength. The real work of the Christian life is when you feel lonely, all alone, like no one understands, it's to believe that in Jesus, his presence, you have total belonging. The work is when you feel tempted to return to sin, to believe that in Jesus, you are strong enough to overcome it. The work of the Christian is to exercise the muscle, muscle of faith that Christ in you is the hope of glory. It's not you living for Jesus. It's Jesus living through you. Jesus is driving. Jesus is steering. Jesus is breathing. Jesus is working. Jesus is leading. Jesus is living in me. I have become a vessel that the spirit of Jesus has taken residence on the inside of, and my body is now fully yielded to his way and to his truth and to his life. 
You see, so much of our life is out of order because Jesus is out of place. Things don't work. They don't make sense. Relationships fractured because we're not living from our place of identity. Next line, the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God. Notice that it doesn't say that Jesus died so that you could continue to live your rebellious lifestyle. What happens when Jesus gets what he wants? We live totally surrendered. Paul says the life I now live different than the life I used to live. Listen, you're not perfect, but you're new. You're not who you want to be, but you're not who you used to be. The idea is that there is this new creation that is growing on the inside that you don't think that way anymore and you don't prioritize that way anymore and you don't spend your money that way anymore and you don't spend your time that way anymore and you don't have that perspective anymore. You don't have that stance anymore. You don't treat people like that anymore. I am a new creation. The life I now live, I'm living this new life with kingdom priorities. Life in Jesus, man, that's the fullest life. There is life with Jesus and life without Jesus and life without Jesus is no life at all. There is this life that is lived by faith in the son of God that is so thrilling, that is so satisfying and that is the way that Jesus intended for us to live. I wanna ask you to ask yourself this question. Am I living by faith in the son of God? Am I trusting Jesus with my future and am I trusting Jesus with my today? If somebody looked at my life, would they say that I have faith in myself, that I have faith in my career, that I have faith in my intellect, that I have faith in my family, that I have faith in my 401k, or that, man, wow, you're living with faith, total faith, total surrender in Jesus. Are you living with faith in your own goodness, your own righteousness, and how well you can perform for God? Are you living faith that what Jesus has done satisfies God's wrath towards you? The narrative of this world is to follow your heart, it's to do what you want, it's to trust your insides. And it's only okay to trust your insides if you're trusting Jesus on the inside of you. Am I trusting Jesus on the inside of me? Not the old man, but the new man. Am I trusting him each and every day? The pursuit of the person who's put their faith in Jesus is Jesus, what are we gonna do today? Who are we gonna love today? Where are we going to go today? Who are we going to serve today? I live by faith in the Son of God. And then here's the end. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Hey, are you living like Jesus loves you and gave himself for you? Are you loving like, are you living like Jesus loves you and gave himself for you. You know, being loved will change a person. Like just from the inside out, being loved changes how you act. Like, I don't know if you can remember back to maybe when you were in grade school and you would send the note to a classmate. You'd see a girl who you thought was maybe cute and you'd write a note, do you like me? Cause I like you so much. Love your hair, love your light up tennis shoes. Do you love me? check yes or no and you'd fold it up in some weird origami shape and you'd pass it through your friends and you'd try to make it where your teacher couldn't see it and the whole time you were just watching and waiting and looking and she got the note and she looked at her friend and showed her friend giggled <laughs> and then she checked something she folded it back up in an origami shape and she passed it over and eventually made its way to you and stopped at your friend and your friend kind of looked at it, gave you the look, folded it up, made its way to you. You open it up and there's that moment of, does she love me? Does she not? You see that she checked yes and all of a sudden something happens on your inside. You start to sweat and you're like, I think I've got to take a shower tomorrow. I'm going to start to comb my hair. I'm going to brush my teeth. I think I'm going to eat vegetables because somebody loves me, changes you. I was uh, talking to my daughter Raleigh recently. We had some people over to our house and 
we have dance parties in our house all of the time. It's just what we do. I get home from work and first thing we do is we put on music and we just have this dance party and thank God for the life that we have and for all the incredible blessings in our life and just celebrates what we do. And recently we had some people over and for the first time I saw my young girl, Raleigh, she was embarrassed to dance. There are these people here and she was like, oh, I don't want them to see me dance. I don't know what they're gonna think of me if I dance. And so I had to pull Raleigh aside and I had to sit down with her and just ask her the questions. Why are we embarrassed? And what's, what's happening? What's going on? We do this all of the time. And she said, you're right, daddy. I forgot that all that matters is how much you love me. Let's go dance. And sure enough, she just starts to dance and lose her little mind and forget about everything else. And what Paul is wanting to do is he's wanting to communicate to you that the love that God has for you is so great that it should change the way that you live where you don't care about what anybody else says or what anybody else thinks and you just live for the glory of his name. Jesus loved you and he gave himself up for you. The motivating factor in the heart of a believer is not that I could somehow earn God's love or work to be good enough for God, but it's that God loves me. And so everything is lived in response to him. And I need to tell you today that God doesn't love a future version of you, that God isn't just putting up with you, that he's not tolerating you, that he's not waiting till you finally get your act together to lavish his love on you, that the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved you when you had nothing in and of yourself that seemed lovable. He loved you then at your worst. And you believing that and resting in that will change totally how you live every day of your life. Jesus is not a businessman looking to do a business deal with you. He is not looking for you to pay him back for what he's done. He is not looking for your religion. He is looking for you to step into this loving relationship with him where you understand your identity appropriately and you live from that place of faith. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the truth of the gospel and for the fight that Paul fought to make it extremely clear to us that what you're after is our faith, but that our faith in you transforms us from the inside out, that we get Christ in us on our insides, that the old us gets crucified, that we get to live a new life by faith in you and that we get to live from this place of love, crazy love, knowing that you gave yourself up for us. I know that there's likely some of you who are in the room today and maybe you've lived a life held hostage by religion or by morality or all of this is brand new to you. But if this is possible, if God would want to come and live on your insides and make you new and crucify the old you and give you a new identity, then you want in on it. And I just wanna give you an opportunity to respond to that today in faith. And you just say this, you say, God, I believe in my heart that Jesus is your son. And I believe in my heart that he died on Calvary for me. God, I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. Today, I believe in my heart that I wanna crown him Lord of my life. If you prayed that prayer, Scripture tells us that the spirit of Jesus came to live on the inside of you, making you a new creation and setting you free from the old man and causing you to rise to live a new life. And we just wanna celebrate that with you today. It is the best decision that you will ever make. And so on the count of three, as a sign of faith, as a sign of surrender, I want for you to raise your hand if you pray that prayer today. One, two. Yeah, amen. God, I thank you for the truth that your gospel is still saving people, that you are chasing after prodigals, that you are running after runaways, that both the religious, the self-righteous, the, the prodigal, you run after all of us with your grace. And Jesus, I just pray today that we would live and stand and rest 
in your amazing grace. And I pray it in your beautiful name and all God's people said, amen.